In the year 1374, the whole of northeastern Spain was suffering terribly from famine and disease. One spring day, in the midst of all this suffering, a crowd of about 20,000 starving people gathered in the great square of Barcelona to hear the message of a young Dominican preacher named Friar Vincent. He told them that their forgetfulness of the laws of God had brought this famine upon them, that it was a punishment for their sins. He called on them to repent. He called on them to trust totally in the divine mercy. And then when he was preaching, he suddenly paused and then announced that two ships filled with wheat would arrive that night in port. This announcement angered the starving people. It was a season of stormy weather at sea. In fact, under the current circumstances, whether it was impossible, totally impossible, for any vessel to make port. Back at the priory, his fellow Dominicans were even more annoyed. The prior strictly forbid Fire Vincent from making any sort of prophecy or doing anything at all in the future which would single him out. Fire Vincent took the correction with sincere humility, didn't lose his peace of soul. He spent the rest of the day in prayer. Imagine the surprise in Barcelona that night when two ships reached harbor filled with wheat. That got everyone's attention. One thing was certain, although he had been forbidden under obedience to do anything remarkable, the faithful now all knew who Friar Vincent was and were no doubt about his powers. And so it happened that one day some black masons working up high on a wall on a, on a prison roof, and they spotted Friar Vincent as he's walking along down the street approaching their work site. And just as he passed along, one of the masons slipped, was unable to keep his balance, and fell off the roof, crying out, Friar Vincent, Friar Vincent. So Friar Vincent yelled at the mason, Stay right where you are till I come back. And immediately the man stopped falling and suspended in midair, hung there high above the street, just dangling there. Well, Friar Vincent ran back to the priory to get a permission. When he got back to the priory, he found the priory and said, A man who is falling off a roof has asked me to help him. So he's waiting till I have your permission. Waiting? Yes, he's waiting. Prior said, well, go back and finish it off. Undoubtedly, there's a crowd. Friar Vincent went back. By this time, in fact, there was a whole crowd of astonished people gaping up uh, into the air, staring at the mason who this whole time had been dangling there in midair. The prior says, you may come down, said Friar Vincent. And the man floated down gently to earth. St. Vincent Ferrer was the fourth of eight children born on January 23, 1350, in Valencia, Spain. For his birth, his father had a dream in which a Dominican priest was preaching a sermon and suddenly stopped and announced that the baby would be a Dominican whose deeds would fill heaven with joy and hell with fear. His mother, who generally had very difficult pregnancies, felt great throughout her pregnancy. She was accustomed to bring flour to a blind woman every month, and she asked the blind woman to pray that she'd have a safe delivery. The blind woman leaned her head on St. Vincent's mother and said, May God bestow that favor on you. And then all of a sudden cried out, The child you're bearing has restored my sight. Well, the woman could see, and like another St. John the Baptist, little Vincent inside his mother womb began jumping up and down. Naturally, this is already one little famous baby before he's born. In fact, his baptism turned into a town event, important dignitaries of the city president arguing over what the child should be named till the parish priest finally broke the deadlock by deciding the child would be named after the patron saint of Valencia, St. Vincent Martyr. And so it happened. And although there were a lot of other miraculous events, even his childhood will just jump forward to when he's 17 in 1367. In the wee hours of the night, the prior of a Dominican friary had a dream or an apparition in which St. Dominic appeared and presented him with this 17-year-old young man. The next morning, the prior met in the flesh the young man he had seen in the previous night's apparition when St. Vincent arrived and presented himself as a postulant to the Dominican order. St. Vincent applied himself to prayer, the study of theology, and the study of sacred scriptures to the point where, after some time, he knew the whole Bible by heart, and he had such a thorough knowledge of Hebrew that he was able to quote every text of the Old Testament in Hebrew from memory. Besides all that, he also had encyclopedic knowledge of the fathers and doctors of the church, as we've seen 
by the middle 1370s, he began to preach and prophesy to great effect. Now, in order to understand the particular mission of St. Vincent Ferrer, it's necessary to have a pretty clear idea of the times in which he lived. One author describes those times, quote, The state of Europe was terrible. Rome named one pope and Avignon another, and Europe was divided between two camps. Just to explain that, the cardinals elected a pope in Rome, then they got mad, fled away, went to Avignon, elected another one. People weren't sure which one was the pope. The two pontiffs fought a war of interdicts, threats, and insults. They died and were replaced, and their successors excommunicated right and left. Well, a third pope, elected by the Council of Pisa, hurled anathemas at the other two. It was no longer possible to know which pastors to obey. It was the most absolute disorder, and Christianity had never been reduced to such chaos. It was as if Satan had mobilized his legions, and the gates of hell were open. The earth belonged to the spirit of evil, and he besieged the church, a signal without respite, gathering all his forces to overthrow her. She had traitors in high places. She had horrible popes. And beyond all that, Satan inspired the impurities of nocturnal Sabbaths in the depths of the forest. The most execrable crimes and acts of sacrilege were committed. Black masses were celebrated. Sorcerers plucked out the entrails of little children, seeking in their remains the secrets of alchemy, the power to turn worthless metals into gold. The most vehement heresies arose and multiplied from one end of the world to the other. Gnosticism sprang up anew, spread, and proclaimed the reign of Lucifer, who had been unjustly expelled from paradise. And in the political order, most of the rulers were either rogues, maniacs, or libertines. Close quote. A contemporary of St. Vincent Ferrer, French mystic Marie Robin, had a vision which summarizes the state of affair within the church. When she saw, quote, all the curates of the world appear before Christ, all the priors, the parish priests, the bishops, the pope, and twelve cardinals. They were simply dressed, but their words were lying. Against them was raised the cry of vengeance of all those who had died without being helped through the fault of these clergymen, close quote. St. Vincent himself describes his times, quote, I do not believe there ever existed in the world so much pomp and vanity, so much impurity as at the present day. To find in the world's history an epoch so criminal, we must go back to the days of Noah and the universal flood. The inns in the cities and villages are filled with persons of abandoned character. They are so numerous that the entire world is infected by them. Avarice and usury increase under disguised name of contracts. Simony reigns among the clergy, envy among the religious. Gluttony prevails to such an extent in every rank of social life that the fasts of Lent, the vigils and ember days, are no longer observed. In a word, vice is held in such great honor that those who prefer the service of God to that of the world are held up to scorn as useless and unworthy members of society. Close quote. So now that we have some idea of the state of society, we can better appreciate his mission. On October 3rd, 1396, when St. Vincent was at death's door, stricken with a terrible fever, our Lord appeared to him, touched him on the cheek, and instantly cured him. And the imprint of his fingerprints remained on St. Vincent's face the rest of his life. Our Lord instantly cured him and commanded him to preach. Go out throughout the world preaching the approachment of Judgment Day. In a move which was later confirmed by both the Council of Constance and Pope Martin V, Benedict XIII took this mission so seriously that he sent St. Vincent out to preach this message, a message so important that Vincent was made a legatus of Terry Christi. What does that mean? It means he was sent out by the Pope, quote, with almost limitless juridical powers to preach anywhere. No diocese, no city, no church could be closed to him. St. Vincent's powers of and exemptions from jurisdiction were second only to those of the Pope himself. Close quote. So St. Vincent traveled across Europe preaching the covenant, coming of the judgment. And during his preaching, he regularly made an absolutely astounding claim. For example, while preaching near Salonica, he told the crowd that the day of judgment was near and that he himself was a messenger of the judgment spoken of in the Apocalypse, chapter 14, verse 6. The Apocalypse, quote, And I saw another angel flying through the midst of heaven, having the eternal gospel 
to preach unto them that sit upon the earth and over every nation and tribe and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear the Lord and give him honor because the hour of his judgment is come. Close quote the book of the Apocalypse. During the sermon, he told some pallbearers who just buried a woman to open the grave and, quote, bring her body to the foot of the platform. There, speaking in a voice loud enough to be heard above the murmurs of a crowd that was not surprisingly indignant because he had taken to himself a title out of the scriptures, he said, Dead woman, arise, and tell these people whether or not I am the messenger of the apocalypse sent to preach the coming of the last day. The woman rose up in her coffin and answered, Yes, Father, you are that messenger, and immediately fell back, rigid and lifeless. Close quote. Now imagine the effect that sermon had on the people listening. There seems to be a problem here, though. Obviously, 600 years have come and gone, and the world has not ended. So what does all this mean? How is it that God would prove the truth of this kind of preaching of St. Vincent's message by miracles like that? In order to understand that, we have to realize that this was a contingent event. Just as God sent uh, Jonas to preach clearly to Nineveh that unless its citizens repented would be destroyed. So also he sent St. Vincent to preach that the end of the world was imminent unless there were true repentance and conversion of Christians and a corresponding reform of the society. Because the Ninevites repented, Nineveh was saved. And because St. Vincent's hearers were converted by his preaching, God delayed the advent of the Antichrist, the end of the world. St. Vincent himself made it clear that, quote, the whole duration of the world rests on a certain conditional prolongation obtained by the Virgin Mary in the hope of the conversion and correction of the world, close quote. In other words, the reason the world didn't end is that there was ultimately a reprieve. Why? Because in response to St. Vincent's preaching, vast numbers of people met the conditions of conversion and correction, which enabled Our Lady to obtain a delay in the time of the general judgment. So for nearly 20 years, St. Vincent traveled around Europe preaching the end of the world. He'd arrive in a town, go to the principal church, pray before the Blessed Sacrament. At dawn, he'd sing Mass and then preach, announcing the judgment and calling people to repentance and the reformation of their lives. Contemporaries testify that he frequently had 80,000 listeners, that he could always be heard distinctly, no matter where people were standing, and that even though he spoke the Valencian dialect of Spain and preached in that dialect, no matter what language his listeners spoke, each of them could understand him as if he was speaking to them in their own native tongue. He would insist that everyone should recite the Apostles' Creed each morning and evening as a defense against errors in the faith, and that, quote, faith follows simple obedience and not argument or reasoning. Argument may be good for the strengthening of the intellect, but is not the true foundation of faith. Those whose faith rests on reason will lose it when they hear the specious reasoning of the Antichrist. Those, on the contrary, who rely on a firm belief founded in obedience will reply, Away with your arguments. Such reasonings are not the grounds of my faith. Close quote, St. Vincent. In other words, St. Vincent reminds us that our faith must be rooted in a simple attitude of God said it. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. St. Vincent also insisted that every man who wished to preserve the gift of faith must conform his behavior to his beliefs. As he pointed out, quote, the diamond is lost easily in a dunghill, and the precious pearl of faith is in great danger of being lost in a conscience defiled with the filth of sin. Close quote St. Vincent. In other words, St. Vincent reminds us that if our moral behavior is not in line with the teaching of faith, in other words, if we're leading bad lives, we're in great peril of losing our faith. After he finished preaching, a bell called the Bell of Miracles would be rung, and then he would bless and cure the sick. Later in the day, he would preach once again, hear confessions, till towards the evening, the bell of miracles would once more be rung, and again he would bless and cure the sick. His preaching was always accompanied by miracles, conversions of life, and conversions of unbelievers. For example, on one occasion, having been invited by the Muslim king of the king of Granada to preach, 18,000 Muslims were converted after hearing three sermons. The king and his entire court decided to be baptized, but the imams threatened them with revolution, loss of the throne, at which point the king decided to ask St. Vincent to return to the country of the Christians. On another occasion, over 30,000 Jews were baptized at the close of his preaching in one area in Spain. 
some cases, entire synagogues became Catholic. According to contemporary Jewish scholars, as a result of his preaching, more than 200,000 Jews were converted in the year 1412 alone. He cured the sick, healed lepers, brought priests to troubled families and feuding communities, delivered the possessed, stopped storms, multiplied loaves and fishes, converted retrobate sinners, raised more than 30 people from the dead. As one author points out, quote, had he in the course of the last 20 years of his life only performed eight miracles a day, they would have reached the extraordinary number of 58,400. But this calculation clearly falls far short of the mark. Hence the common saying, it was a miracle when he did not work miracles, and the greatest miracle was when he performed no miracles at all. St. Louis Bertrand confirmed this testimony, quote, God sanctioned the teaching of St. Vincent Ferrer by so many miracles that there never was a saint since the days of the apostles to her own time that wrought more. God alone knows their number, as he alone knows the number of stars in the sky, close quote, St. Louis Bertrand. In 1419, after almost 20 years of traveling Europe from north to south, east to west, St. Vincent grew seriously ill while he was preaching in Brittany. His companions insist that he return to Spain where the climate might be more conducive to his health. Although it had been revealed to him that he was to die there in Brittany, in order to avoid troubling his companions one evening, he set out with them on a journey towards Spain. After traveling for an entire night at daybreak, they found themselves at the gate of the city they had left the night before. They traveled an entire night without getting anywhere. St. Vincent turned to his companion and said, My brethren, let us not speak of returning to Spain. You see clearly that it's God's will that I should end my days here. Indeed he did, dying on April 5th, 1419. In the Bull of Canonization, Pope Pius II confirmed St. Vincent's claim to be the angel of the apocalypse when he stated, quote, The last day, the terrible day of judgment, was almost forgotten, but at a favorable moment, God sent into the world for the salvation of the faithful Vincent of Valencia of the Order of Friars Preachers, a skillful professor of sacred theology. Like a vigorous athlete, he rushed to combat the errors of the Jews, the Saracens, and other infidels. He was the angel of the apocalypse, flying through the heavens to announce the day of the last judgment, to evangelize inhabitants of the earth, to sow the seeds of salvation among all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, and to point out the way of eternal life. Close quote, the vicar of Christ. So as we close, what are the lessons that St. Vincent can teach us that live today? We'll just briefly consider two. Message of reverent fear and a message of profound hope. The message of reverent fear. There is a judgment coming. There are no excuses possible. St. Vincent reminds us that we must repent. We must convert our lives. We must do penance or we will face the most terrible consequences. Message of profound hope. Conversion and penance can buy a reprieve. Yes, there will come a time when the last reprieve has been granted, and then that terrible judgment will fall upon mankind. But even if we are indeed living in that very time, if we have redeemed the time by converting, if we've redeemed the time by manfully doing battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil, if we've redeemed the time by living a life of faith, a life of penance, a life of good works, then we have every reason to hope that, come what may, we too will be saved. This Lent, let's keep this message of reverent fear and this message of profound hope before our mind's eyes in order to inspire us to greater generosity in our prayers, in our fasting, in our almsgivings, to inspire us to truly strip free of all our worldly desires and attachments any sinful attachments, and draw ever closer to the cross of Christ. And thus, by our daily conversion, to prepare ourselves for the just judgments of our Lord.